This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapters from My Autobiography by Mark Twain. Chapter 1. From North American Review, September 7, 1906. Prefatory Note. Mr. Clemens began to write his autobiography many years ago, and he continues to add to it day by day. It was his original intention to permit no publication of his memoirs until after his death. But after leaving Pier No. 70, he concluded that a considerable portion might now suitably be given to the public. It is that portion, garnered from the quarter million of words already written, which will appear in this review during the coming year. No part of the autobiography will be published in book form during the lifetime of the author. Editor N. A. R. Introduction I intend that this autobiography shall become a model for all future autobiographies when it is published, after my death, and I also intend that it shall be read and admired a good many centuries because of its form and method, a form and method whereby the past and the present are constantly brought face to face, resulting in contrasts which newly fire up the interest all along, like contact of flint and steel. Moreover, this autobiography of mine does not select from my life its showy episodes, but deals mainly in the common experiences which go to make up the life of the average human being, because these episodes are of a sort which he is familiar with in his own life and in which he sees his own life reflected and set down in print. The usual conventional autobiographer seems to particularly hunt out those occasions in his career when he came into contact with celebrated persons, whereas his contacts with the uncelebrated were just as interesting to him and would be to his reader, and were vastly more numerous than his collisions with the famous. Howells was here yesterday afternoon, and I told him the whole scheme of this autobiography and its apparently systemless system, only apparently systemless, for it is not really that. It is a deliberate system, and the law of the system is that I shall talk about the matter which for the moment interests me, and cast it aside and talk about something else the moment its interest for me is exhausted. It is a system which follows no charted course, and is not going to follow any such course. It is a system which is a complete and purposed jumble, a course which begins nowhere, follows no spe specified route, and can never reach an end while I am alive, for the reason that if I should talk to the stenographer two hours a day for a hundred years, I should still never be able to set down a tenth part of the things which have interested me in my lifetime. I told Howells that this autobiography of mine would live a couple thousand years without any effort and would then take a fresh start and live the rest of the time. He said he believed it would, and asked me if I meant to make a library of it. I said that that was my design, but that if I should live long enough, the set of volumes could not be contained merely in a city, it would require a state, and that there would not be any multi-billionaire alive, perhaps, at any time during its existence, who would be able to buy a full set, except on the installment plan. Howells applauded, and was full of praises and endorsement, which was wise in him and judicious. If he had manifested a different spirit, I would have thrown him out the window. I like criticism, but it must be my way. Number 1. Back of the Virginia Clemenses is a dim procession of ancestors stretching back to Noah's time. According to tradition, some of them were pirates and slavers in Elizabeth's time. But this is no discredit to them for so were Drake and Hawkins and the others. It was a respectable trade, then, and monarchs were partners in it. In my time I have had desires to be a pirate myself. The reader, if he will look deep down in his secret heart, will find—but never mind what he will find there—I am not writing his autobiography, but mine. Later, according to tradition, one of the processions was— ambassador to Spain in the time of James I, or of Charles I, and married there and sent down a strain of Spanish blood to warm us up. Also, according to tradition, this one or another, Geoffrey Clement by name, helped to sentence Charles to death. 
I have not examined into these traditions myself, partly because I was indolent, and partly because I was so busy polishing up this end of the line and trying to make it showy. But the other Clemenses claim that they have made the examination and that it stood the test. Therefore I have always taken for granted that I did help Charles out of his troubles by ancestral proxy. My instincts have persuaded me, too. Whenever we have a strong and persistent and ineradicable instinct, we may be sure that it is not original with us, but inherited, inherited from away back, and hardened and perfected by the petrifying influence of time. Now I have been always and unchangingly bitter against Charles, and I am quite certain that this feeling trickled down to me through the veins of my forebears from the heart of that judge, for it is not my disposition to be bitter against people on my own personal account. I am not bitter against Jeffreys. I ought to be, but I am not. It indicates that my ancestors of James II's time were indifferent to him. I do not know why. I never could make it out. But that is what it indicates. And I have always felt friendly towards Satan. Of course, that is ancestral. It must be in the blood, for I could not have originated it. And so, by the testimony of instinct, backed by the assertions of Clemenses who said they had examined the records, I have always been obliged to believe that Geoffrey Clemen, the martyr-maker, was an ancestor of mine, and to regard him with favor, and, in fact, pride. This has not had a good effect upon me, for it has made me vain, and that is a fault. It has made me set myself above people who were less fortunate in their ancestry than I, and has moved me to take them down a peg, upon occasion, and say things to them which hurt them before company. A case of the kind happened in Berlin several years ago. William Walter Phelps was our minister at the Emperor's court then, and one evening he had me to dinner, to meet Count S., a cabinet minister. This nobleman was of long and illustrious descent. Of course, I wanted to let out the fact that I had some ancestors, too. But I did not want to pull them out of their graves by the ears, and I never could seem to get the chance to work them in in a way that would look sufficiently casual. I suppose Phelps was in the same difficulty. In fact, he looked distraught now and then, just as a person looks who wants to uncover an ancestor purely by accident, and cannot think of a way that will seem accidental enough. But at last, after dinner, he made a try. He took us about his drawing-room, showing us the pictures, and finally stopped before a rude and ancient engraving. It was a picture of the court that tried Charles I. There was a pyramid of judges in Puritan slouch hats, and below them three bareheaded secretaries seated at a table. Mr. Phelps put his finger upon one of the three, and said with exulting indifference, "'An ancestor of mine!' I put my finger on a judge, and retorted with scathing languidness, "'Ancestor of mine! But it is a small matter. I have others.' It was not noble in me to do it. I have always regretted it since. But it landed him. I wonder how he felt. However, it made no difference in our friendship, which shows that he was fine and high, notwithstanding the humbleness of his origin. And it was also credible in me, too, that I could overlook it. I made no change in my bearing toward him, but always treated him as an equal. But it was a hard night for me in one way. Mr. Phelps thought I was the guest of honor, and so did Count S. But I didn't, for there was nothing in my invitation to indicate it. It was just a friendly off-hand note on a card. By the time dinner was announced, Phelps was himself in a state of doubt. Something had to be done, and it was not a handy time for explanations. He tried to get me to go out with him, but I held back. Then he tried S, and he also declined. There was another guest, but there was no trouble about him. We finally went out in a pile. There was a decorous plunge for seats, and I got the one at Mr. Phelps' left. The Count captured the one facing Phelps, and the other guest had to take the place of honor, since he could not help himself. We returned to the drawing-room in the original disorder. I had new shoes on, and they were tight. At eleven I was privately crying. I couldn't help it. The pain was so cruel. Conversation had been dead for an hour. S. had been due at the bedside of a dying official ever since half-past nine. 
At last we all rose by one blessed impulse and went down to the street door without explanations, in a pile, and no precedence, and so parted. The evening had its defects. Still, I got my ancestor in, and was satisfied. Among the Virginian Clemenses were Jerry, already mentioned, and Sherard. Jerry Clemens had a wide reputation as a good pistol shot, and once it enabled him to get on the friendly side of some drummers when they wouldn't have paid any attention to mere smooth words and arguments. He was out stumping the state at the time. The drummers were grouped in front of the stand, and had been hired by the opposition to drum while he made his speech. When he was ready to begin, he got out his revolver and laid it before him, and said in his soft, silky way, "'I do not wish to hurt anybody, and shall try not to, but I have got just a bullet apiece for those six drums, and if you should want to play on them, don't stand behind them.' Sherard Clemens was a Republican congressman from West Virginia in the war days, and then went out to St. Louis, where the James Clemens branch lived, and still lives, and there he became a warm rebel. This was after the war. At the time that he was a Republican, I was a rebel. But by the time he became a rebel, I was become temporarily a Republican. The Clemenses have always done the best they could to keep the political balances level, no matter how much it might inconvenience them. I did not know what had become of Sherard Clemens. But once I introduced Senator Hawley to a Republican mass meeting in New England, and then I got a bitter letter from Sherard from St. Louis. He said that the Republicans of the North, no, the Mudaiels of the North, had swept away the old aristocracy of the South with fire and sword, and it ill became me, an aristocrat by blood, to train with that kind of swine. Did I forget that I was a Lampton? That was a reference to my mother's side of the house. As I have already said, she was a Lampton. Lampton with a P, for some of the American Lamptons could not spell very well in early times, and so the name suffered at their hands. She was a native of Kentucky, and married my father in Lexington in 1823, when she was twenty years old and he twenty-four. Neither of them had an overplus of property. She brought him two or three negroes, but nothing else, I think. They removed to the remote and secluded village of Jamestown in the mountain solitudes of East Tennessee. There their first crop of children was born, but as I was of a later vintage, I do not remember anything about it. I was postponed, postponed to Missouri. Missouri was an unknown new state and needed attractions. I think that my eldest brother Orion, my sisters Pamela and Margaret, and my brother Benjamin were born in Jamestown. There may have been others, but as to that I am not sure. It was a great lift for that little village to have my parents come there. It was hoped that they would stay, so that it would become a city. It was supposed that they would stay and so there was a boom. But by and by they went away, and prices went down, and it was many years before Jamestown got another start. I have written about Jamestown in The Gilded Age, a book of mine, but it was from hearsay, not from personal knowledge. My father left a fine estate behind him in the region round about Jamestown, seventy-five thousand acres. Footnote. Correction. 1906. It was above one hundred thousand, it appears. When he died in 1847, he had owned it about twenty years. The taxes were almost nothing, five dollars a year for the whole. And he had always paid them regularly, and kept his title perfect. He had always said that the land would not become valuable in his time, but that it would be a commodious provision for his children some day. It contained coal, copper, iron, and timber, and he said that in the course of time railways would pierce to that region and then the property would be property in fact as well as in name. It also produced a wild grape of a promising sort. He had sent some samples to Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati to get his judgment upon them, and Mr. Longworth had said that they would make as good wine as his Catawbas. The land contained all these riches, and also oil, but my father did not know that, and of course in those early days he would have cared nothing about it if he had known it. The oil was not discovered until about 1895. I wish I had owned a couple of acres of the land now, in which case I would not be writing autobiographies for a living. My father's dying charge was, 
Cling to the land and wait. Let nothing beguile it away from you. My mother's favorite cousin, James Lampton, who figures in the Gilded Age as Colonel Sellers, always said of that land, and said it with blazing enthusiasm, too, There's millions in it! Millions! It is true that he always said that about everything, and was always mistaken, too. But this time he was right. Which shows that a man who goes around with a prophecy gun ought never to get discouraged. If he will keep up his heart and fire at everything he sees, he is bound to hit something by and by. Many persons regarded Colonel Sellers as a fiction, an invention, an extravagant impossibility, and did me the honor to call him a creation. But they were mistaken. I merely put him on paper as he was. He was not a person who could be exaggerated. The incidents which looked most extravagant, both in the book and on the stage, were not inventions of mine, but were facts of his life, and I was present when they were developed. John T. Raymond's audiences used to come near to dying with laughter over the turnip-eating scene, but extravagant as the scene was, it was faithful to the facts, in all its absurd details. The thing happened in Lampton's own house, and I was present. In fact, I was myself the guest who ate the turnips. In the hands of a great actor, that piteous scene would have dimmed any manly spectator's eyes with tears, and racked his ribs apart with laughter at the same time. But Raymond was great in humorous portrayal only. In that he was superb, he was wonderful, in a word, great. In all things else, he was a pygmy of the pygmies. The real Colonel Sellers, as I knew him, in James Lampton, was a pathetic and beautiful spirit, a manly man, a straight and honorable man, a man with a big, foolish, unselfish heart in his bosom, a man born to be loved, and he was loved by all his friends, and by his family worshipped. It is the right word. To them he was but little less than a god. The real Colonel Sellers was never on the stage. Only half of him was there. Raymond could not play the other half of him. It was above his level. That half was made up of qualities of which Raymond was wholly destitute. For Raymond was not a manly man. He was not an honorable man, nor an honest one. He was empty and selfish, and vulgar and ignorant and silly, and there was a vacancy in him where his heart should have been. There was only one man who could have played the whole of Colonel Sellers, and that was Frank Mayo. Footnote. Raymond was playing Colonel Sellers in 1876, and along there, about twenty years later, Mayo dramatized Puddinhead Wilson, and played the title role delightfully. It is a world of surprises. They fall, too, where one is least expecting them. When I introduced Sellers into the book, Charles Dudley Warner, who was writing the story with me, proposed a change of Sellers' Christian name. Ten years before, in a remote corner of the West, he had come across a man named Eschel Sellers, and he thought that Eschel was just the right and fitting name for our Sellers, since it was odd and quaint and all that. I liked the idea, but I said that that man might turn up and object. But Warner said it couldn't happen, that he was doubtless dead by this time. A man with a name like that couldn't live long, and, be he dead or alive, we must have the name. It was exactly the right one, and we couldn't do without it. So the change was made. Warner's man was a farmer in a cheap and humble way. When the book had been out a week, a college-bred gentleman of courtly manners and ducal upholstery arrived in Hartford in a sultry state of mind and with a libel suit in his eye, and his name was Eschel Sellers. He had never heard of the other one, and had never been within a thousand miles of him. This damaged aristocrat's program was quite definite and businesslike. The American Publishing Company must suppress the edition as far as printed, and change the name in the plates, or stand a suit for ten thousand dollars. He carried away the company's promise and many apologies, and we changed the name back to Colonel Mulberry Sellers in the plates. Apparently there is nothing that cannot happen. Even the existence of two unrelated men wearing the impossible name of Eschel Sellers is a possible thing. James Lampton floated all his days in a tinted mist of magnificent dreams, and died at last without seeing one of them realized. 
I saw him last in 1884, when it had been twenty-six years since I ate the basin of raw turnips and washed them down with a bucket of water in his house. He was become old and white-headed, but he entered to me in the same old breezy way of his earlier life, and he was all there yet, not a detail wanting. The happy light in his eye, the abounding hope in his heart, the persuasive tongue, the miracle-breeding imagination, they were all there and before I could turn around he was polishing up his Aladdin's lamp and flashing the secret riches of the world before me. I said to myself, I did not overdraw him by a shade. I set him down as he was, and he is the same man today. Cable will recognize him. I asked him to excuse me a moment and ran into the next room, which was Cable's. Cable and I were stumping the Union on a reading tour, and I said, I am going to leave your door open so that you can listen. There is a man in there who is interesting. I went back and asked Lampton what he was doing now, and he began to tell me of a small venture he had begun in New Mexico through his son. Only a little thing, a mere trifle, partly to amuse my leisure, partly to keep my capital from lying idle, but mainly to develop the boy. Develop the boy. Fortune's wheel is ever revolving. He may have to work for his living some day, as strange things have happened in this world. But it's only a little thing, a mere trifle, as I said. And so it was, as he began it. But under his deft hands it grew, and blossomed, and spread, oh, beyond imagination. At the end of half an hour he finished, finished with a remark, uttered in an adorably languid manner. Yes, it is but a trifle, as things go nowadays. A bagatelle, but amusing. It passes the time. The boy thinks great things of it, but he is young, you know, and imaginative. Lacks the experience which comes of handling large affairs, and which temper the fancy and perfects the judgment. I suppose there's a couple of millions in it, possibly three, but not more, I think. Still, for a boy, you know, just starting in life, it is not bad. I should not want him to make a fortune, let that come later. It could turn his head, at his time of life, and in many ways be a damage to him. Then he said something about his having left his pocket-book lying on the table in the main drawing-room at home, and about it being after banking hours now, and I stopped him there, and begged him to honor Cable and me by being our guest at the lecture, with as many friends as might be willing to do us the like honor. He accepted and he thanked me as a prince might who had granted us a grace. The reason I stopped his speech about the tickets was because I saw that he was going to ask me to furnish them to him and let him pay next day, and I knew that if he made the debt he would pay it if he had to pawn his clothes. After a little further chat he shook hands heartily and affectionately, and took his leave. Cable put his head in at the door and said, "'That was Colonel Sellers!' Mark Twain. To be continued. End of chapter 1